In 1954, the United States Supreme Court issued its landmark decision in the Brown versus Board of Education case, which ushered in the desegregation of public schools around the country. Even though in its follow-up Brown II case a year later, the court ordered all schools in the country to desegregate with, quote, all deliberate speed, the initial pace of change was very slow. Thus, in 1957, three years after the Brown decision, Little Rock Central High School, arguably the best high school in Arkansas and among the top in the nation, was still reserved for white students only, even though a substantial proportion of the population in that city was African American. That year, at age 14, Carlotta Walls Lanier became the youngest member of the Little Rock Nine, the first group of nine African American students to enroll in Central High School. Some people choose to make history. They do so by running for political office or by consciously choosing to take bold and historic action. But I think if you ask Ms. Lanier, she would tell you that was not what she, her classmates, and their families sought to do. They were not trying to make history. They were simply trying to do what all of the parents in this arena seek for their children and what all of you who are embarking on teaching careers hope to do. That is to create the best educational opportunity for their children and for all children regardless of their race or ethnicity. And that is what Ms. Lanier and her classmates were trying to do. Get the best education available to them in the city of Little Rock, which they believed would be at Central High School. But their path was not easy, as I know Ms. Lanier will share with you in a few minutes. Let me provide you with just one brief example that I have taken from her memoir, A Mighty Long Way, My Journey to Justice at Little Rock Central High School, as she describes her first days in that school. The band of white boys in the black leather jackets were the worst offenders. They made a sport of spitting on me. If you've ever been hit by a nasty gob, you know how disgusting it is how humiliating, how infuriating. The first time, the wet slime just came flying out of nowhere, landing on the bottom left side of my face. My military escort usually walked on my right. I was trying to work my way through the crowded halls between classes on my second day inside, when without warning, I felt something wet hit my face. Who had done it? Was it one of the black leather boys? Or did it come from one of their ponytailed female cohorts? In either case, there was nothing I could do to respond. I had already been warned against retaliation. Now, President Eisenhower had to call in the Army's 101st Airborne Division to protect Ms. Lanier and her classmates after the Little Rock Police and the Arkansas National Guard failed to do their jobs. There is much more to this story, but I will let Ms. Lanier tell you herself. After graduating from Central in 1960, she attended Michigan State University, where she spent two years before leaving for Colorado. After moving there, she enrolled in the University of Northern Colorado, where she graduated and later embarked on a successful career as a real estate broker in the Denver area. Today, 57 years after first enrolling in Central High School, she is still working as a real estate broker in the Denver area. In addition to her business career, she's also the president of the Little Rock Nine Foundation and is the recipient of honorary degrees from four universities. In 1999, she and her fellow members of Little Rock Nine received the Congressional Gold Medal, the nation's highest civilian honor from President Bill Clinton. As Michigan State is in the midst of our year-long celebration of the 60th anniversary of the Brown decision and the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I can think of no more fitting person to help us commemorate these milestones than Carlotta Walls Lanier. Please join me in welcoming her back to Michigan State University. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow Spartans. 
First, I must say a special thank you to Dean Heller uh, for inviting me to speak on this special occasion. Allow me also to thank President Simon and the Board of Trustees for welcoming me back uh, to Uni Michigan State and to the faculty, staff, and family members for your important roles in getting these young people to this day. And most especially to the honorees, the Department of Education's class of 2014, congratulations. I applaud you. I salute you. Your graduation says much about your determination to reach your goal, but this is just the beginning. With the full weight of a Michigan State University education propelling you into your futures, you start out of the gate ahead of the pack. I feel honored to be here to share with you some of what I've learned during my journey. It is so fitting that I am here during your Project 6050 commemoration of two landmark historical events, the 60th anniversary of the United States Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education and the 50th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Both had such a huge impact on my life and I appreciate the Office for Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives for coordinating this project, pushing us to look at who we were as a nation, who we are today, and who we can become. This is indeed a full circle moment for me. Michigan State University opened its doors and its arms to me in 1960 when I was a shell-shocked 17-year-old girl who had just gone through the most difficult time of my life as one of the first nine black students to integrate Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. It had all played out under the intense glare of the media. The city of my birth bitterly divided over school integration, so divided in fact, that September 25, 1957, President Dwight Eisenhower had to dispatch the U.S. military to protect my eight comrades and me from mobs of armed and angry white segregationists. The president also had to show the governor of Arkansas, who had tried to block our entrance to the school, that he was not above the law. The U.S. Supreme Court had outlawed school se segregation just three years earlier, and President Eisenhower's intervention in Little Rock marked the first time a U.S. president had turned to the military to enforce a school desegregation order. I hadn't been trying to do anything monumental when I signed my name to the list of black students who volunteered to go to Central. I was just a 14-year-old high school sophomore trying to do what the U.S. Supreme Court had said in the Brown decision that I had a right to do, attend my neighborhood school without regard of the color of my skin. My dream was to become a doctor, and Central was not only one of America's most beautiful schools, but it was also one of the best academically. I figured that there would be some who didn't want me there, but I kept hoping that Everything would be different once the students and faculty got a chance to know me. But the difference I'd been hoping for never came. And for the entire first year, the situation was so dangerous that the nine of us had to be driven to and from school and escorted by individual soldiers to and from our classes. Still, fellow students found ways to spit on us push us into lockers and downstairs, threaten and call us derogatory names. But the harder the segregationists fought to drive me out, the more firmly I planted my feet to stand for what I knew was right. I found strength that I didn't even know I had and persevered. Graduates, you already possess the smarts you need to achieve your dreams but life's most challenging moments can 
if you let them build strength, character, and fortitude. And if you let them, life's most trying times can push you to be even greater than you ever imagined. Some of life's greatest thinkers, teachers, innovators, just first crashed into the proverbial brick wall before finding new ways to get over or through it. The world, and not just the world at large, but the world around you, most especially in the field of education, needs great thinkers, teachers, and innovators. We need people who can look at the same old problems with fresh insight and figure out how to elevate the American education system once again to its top rank in the world. But we also need people who are willing to be guided at times by their hearts. I often think about how much easier my survival at Central would have been if more of my classmates had stood up for me. When I was suffering in those halls, my fellow students fell into one of three categories. Number one, the tormentors, the small but loud group of people who spent most of their days trying to make my life a living hell. Number two, the silent, by far the largest group, those who said nothing, looked the other way, or offered a kind smile or gesture in secret, fearful of what would happen to themselves if their sympathy were discovered. And then number three, the brave, the smallest group of all, those teachers and students who openly kind, who were openly kind, looked beyond my skin color, saw just another human being, a fellow student, eager to learn, and treated me as such. As future educators, you will have greater direct influence on the minds and hearts of generations to come than your colleagues in perhaps any other field. That is both a great privilege and a great responsibility. Please handle with care. Be first good examples. Be open, tolerant, loving, and kind. Then teach your students the lessons of our history about Brown versus Board of Education the Little Rock Nine, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and all of the heroes and sheroes who fought and died and pushed this country to live up to the ideals upon which it was founded. Teach them about who we were as a people and who we are when we lean toward intolerance, bigotry, and hatred. Show them how to be among the brave. By the time I got to MSU in 1960, I was exhausted. I was weary of the spotlight and wanted nothing more than to be anonymous, just another freshman in the crowd. And on this far sprawling campus of more than 20,000 students at the time, I found just what I needed. MSU was then, as it is today, practically a city unto itself full of people of all races and cultures from all over the world, and it became my haven. I felt truly welcome, and I was finally able to roam freely without fear for my life. I thoroughly enjoyed sitting in the stands at Spartan Stadium and cheering for our beloved football team. I vividly remember hanging out with some of the football and basketball greats of my era, and mingling in the student union between and after classes. And of course, there were the fraternity parties on the weekends. <laughs> now, all of this was extra exciting to me because at Central, the nine black students that I was one of had been forbidden from participating in extracurricular activities and even attending sporting events. MSU offered me the college experience of my dreams, but for the first time in my life, I began to struggle academically. I'd always been a top student, but in what would, should have been my junior year of high school, the governor of Arkansas, still fighting to have his way, has shut down every high school 
in Little Rock for the entire school year rather than to be forced to continue with integration. That left 3,800 students of every race scrambling to get an education the best way they could. Though I took correspondence courses and spent some time studying out of state, I had lost an entire school year at the most crucial time in my academic life, and I'd been unable to take the high-level math and science courses that were necessary to be successful in the pre-med program at MSU. In my freshman year here, a university counselor was blunt in his assessment of my chances of making it in the program. Catching up would have required more mental and physical energy and focus than I had. I hung in there another year, but when my dream of becoming a doctor began to die, so did my focus, and I ultimately left Michigan State without a degree. You may learn someday that life can be frightening, frustrating, and devastating when your plans and dreams are driven off course. But if you remember nothing else, remember this. I am a living witness that you can make mid-course corrections, alter your map, a little or a lot, or draft an entirely new one. To those who are driven and determined, there is never just one way to your destination. And I was not raised to be a quitter. So I moved to Denver, returned to college part-time while working, and graduated from Colorado State College, which is now University of Northern Colorado. I got married, had two children, and eventually built my own real estate brokerage business. I didn't become a doctor but I was still able to achieve the success I desired and live a fulfilling life. I am so grateful today that I've been able to share so much of my journey with my mother, Juanita Walls, who is alive and well and lives near me in Denver. She and my father, Cartel U. Walls, who died in 1976, always have been my heroes. But when I became a parent myself, I truly understood the level of courage and faith that they possessed to be able to send me off into such danger each day. They understood the greater good and accepted the personal risk. So I take every opportunity that I can to honor them. Likewise, graduates, I urge you to take the time to show your gratitude to the family and friends who have shared this journey with you most especially your parents. No ma matter how high you climb or how deep you may fall, they are the ones most likely to be there, loving you through it all. To this day, I still miss my father. I saw what he endured because of my decision to attend Central, and for many years I felt tremendous guilt. He was a brick mason, in construction, but he couldn't find jobs in Little Rock once the word got out that his daughter was one of those nine. Some of the other parents faced similar troubles. Then in February of 1960, I re uh, returned to Little Rock Central High School as a senior, determined to finish what I had begun. My family's home was bombed. None of us was injured. But my father, who had always been an upstanding citizen and family man, was questioned as a suspect in the bombing. He was detained for a few days without us knowing uh, where or what was happening to him. And it, it was a grave injustice that grieves me still. Even worse, my childhood friend and neighbor, who like me was just a naive teenager, was arrested and convicted by an all-white jury for the bombing. He served nearly two years of a five-year sentence for the crime, which I've always known in my soul that he did not commit. He, too, had to find peace with Little Rock, and he now lives not far from here in Michigan. And let me say something about peace. For 30 years after I left Little Rock, I wanted nothing to do with the memories of what happened to me there. People who knew the history called uh, what we had done there heroic, but for me personally, the wounds were too deep and the pain too great for me to think of it all. 
So I didn't say a word about my past. Not to my husband, not to my neighbors in Denver, not to my children, until they were old enough to start reading about history and asking questions. It was if by keeping all of that hurt rolled up inside, I thought that I could keep it blocked and locked away forever. But a surprising thing happened when I finally started to let it out, to share my story. I not only made peace with my past, I found passion and purpose. I joined my other eight comrades, Minnie Jean Brown, Elizabeth Eckford, Thelma Mothershed, Melba Patillo, Gloria Ray, Terrence Roberts, fellow Michigan State Spartan, Ernest Green, and, late, and the late Jefferson Thomas in forming the Little Rock Nine Foundation. We've raised money and awarded scholarships to deserving young people, mentored them, and tried to leave a legacy that will outlive each one of us. I also wrote my memoir a few years ago and contributed some personal items, including the dress that I wore on that historic day in Little Rock to the new National Museum of African American History and culture scheduled for completion in the nation's capital next year. When passion and purpose unite, there truly is no limit to the good that can arise. I never imagined when I left this university all those years ago, feeling like that I had failed to myself and my family, that life would circle back and land me here in this place of honor standing before you as your commencement speaker. I am humbled and so honored. It is your turn now. You have been given the best possible start. Your future awaits. And in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, if you can't fly, then run. And if you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Congratulations and go green.